on Network Africa. Former president of South Africa and last ruler during apartheid, F.W. de Klerk dies at the age of 85. The U.S. says it's hopeful that diplomacy will end the war in Ethiopia. Plus, Eleven students injured following an explosion at the University of Pua in the restive southwest region of Cameroon. Hello and welcome to Network Africa. I'm Layo Adigoki. We begin in South Africa, where the last president to rule during apartheid and a key actor in the country's transition to democracy, F.W. de Klerk, has died. The F.W. de Klerk Foundation confirmed that the 85-year-old died on Thursday morning at his home in Fresnaye after he struggled against cancer. He is survived by his wife, two children and grandchildren. De Klerk was the head of state from September 1989 until May 1994 and became one of the country's two deputy presidents after the first multiracial democratic election in April 1994. He shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Nelson Mandela in 1993 for helping to end the legalized system of racial discrimination in South Africa known as apartheid. Here's more on who he was. F.W. de Klerk was a major force in South Africa's transition from apartheid state to fully fledged democracy. Yesterday was correctly described as the final moment of the birth of a nation. That nation needs a sound, strong, multi-party system. While the tide of history would probably have made the change inevitable, it was the clerk who accelerated the pace of reform. Essentially a conservator by nature, the last president of a segregated nation came to believe that the white minority rule was not sustainable. I wish to put it plainly that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. His ending of the ban on the African National Congress and freeing of Nelson Mandela were the steps that triggered the move to majority the rule. Will take a soon. Frederick Willem de Klerk was born on 18th of March 1936 in Johannesburg into a line of Afrikaner National Party politicians. His father, Jan, had been a cabinet minister. He went to Pontchartrain University, known for its conservatism, and by the time he took his law degree, apartheid was firmly established. After 11 years as a lawyer in 1972, he won a safe parliamentary seat for the National Party, which had introduced the system of apartheid in 1948. A series of ministerial posts, the last in education, took him to the top of his party. At the time, he was a firm believer in apartheid and its legal architecture, separate residential areas, schools and institutions for different race groups. <laughs> Nevertheless, de Klerk was a relative outsider when he became party leader in February 1989 after President E.W. Bothers suffered a stroke. I, Friedrich Willem de Klerk, to swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. De Klerk demonstrated that he was prepared to thread where Botha had never dared. He publicly called for a non-racist South Africa, and late in 1989, a free top African National Congress official, Walter Sisulu, and other political prisoners as a preliminary move ahead of his more sweeping reforms. <laughs> <laughs> On 2nd of February 1990, 
President-day clerk lifted a ban on the ANC and released Nelson Mandela nine days later. The prohibition of the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and a number of subsidiary organizations is being rescinded. <laughs> it must have been apparent to the clerk as he watched Mandela walk to freedom that his own days in power were numbered <laughs> the remainder of his term in office was dominated by the negotiations that were to eventually lead to a majority rule. Our South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Debia joins us now for more. Hello Betty, sad day in South Africa today. How are citizens reacting to the death of F.W. de Klerk? Well, reactions are mixed and a lot of people are not even pretending about it, but um, it is a sad day. Somebody has died, somebody's father, grandfather, and, and a relative has died. So, um, and also you can't throw away what he, he uh, the role he has played in the country um, in, in the transition from apartheid uh, governance or government into a multiracial democracy that they have. But reactions have been mixed. Um, but it is a sad day. Somebody has died. And what about tributes being pouring in? Uh, tributes have been pouring in. We've heard from the various foundations. Uh, the, the, uh, his own foundation made the statement confirming it. That's the FW De Class Foundation. Uh, we've heard from the president, Sir Ramaphosa, who has... Um, uh, commiserated with his family, commended him for the role he's played. And of course, every almost all the tributes, depending on the side of, of the history of the country that you're standing, uh, is tinted with uh, how they feel about certain things that he may have done. But generally, uh, uh, tributes have been pouring in. Uh, uh, Prince Mangosuto Butelezi has released this, a statement some people are already protesting in their statement saying he mustn't be, be given uh, a state funeral. But uh, he uh, led the country at some point and then he was a deputy president because the statement from the presidency referred to him as deputy president F.W. de Klerk. Remember, he was state president before the fall of apartheid. Uh, uh, but uh, from 1994, he was the deputy president in the government of national unity. So as the deputy state president, Probably that will happen, but um, nothing has been said yet regarding the funeral or how he's going to be honoured. The president, in his own statement that he said outside parliament today, uh, was that um, we're waiting for the family and the FW Declared Foundation to give more details uh, on the funeral arrangements. Then we stand ready to, to take our play our own part uh, in the ceremonies or, or the events that will happen. Well, let's talk about his legacy. He was the last president of apartheid South Africa and quite a controversial figure, one might add. What would he be remembered for? Um, in his own words, he says, I want to be remembered uh, uh, for the role that I played in, in helping my country to avoid catastrophe you know, uh, embracing the reforms that had started, according to him, before him, uh, and that staying up with that, uh, and using the opportunity around the time, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the window, and, and just because some people think it was an opportunity trying to play a hero, including his own people. You know, he's saying he had to play the role that he did uh, by making that speech in February uh, 1990 on banning all the political organizations, the struggle organizations, releasing all the political um, prisoners and putting a moratorium on the death penalty uh, at that time. And some of the bodies that he constituted to look into all the things that happened during uh, the apartheid, apartheid era. So it, it's mixed. A lot of people saying uh, saying he, he did what he did, probably what history assigned him to do. Uh, some are saying he didn't go far enough, especially the issue of admitting that uh, apartheid was um, a, a crime against humanity, uh, according to the stand of the United Nations uh, at the time. But he's saying, I apologize for the things that happened. Uh, it, it was wrong. You know, um, I, as a younger person, supported what he calls, he didn't want to use the word about 
apartheid, but what he called se separated development, you know, um, having the different ethnicities separate. But he also released a statement just before he died. He said it's his last statement and his goodbye to the people of South Africa, and that he will say goodbye to his wife in a separate way, uh, apologizing again and asking the people to. Uh, Embrace the constitution, respect the constitution, embrace multiracialism in the country, uh, and support the government to take the country in the right path so that uh, all the wrong things that are going on now uh, will get better. But uh, it's a mixed legacy, but he, he played the role that he played. He didn't have to make, make that speech, but he did, uh, following what may have been what had been going on at the time, uh, following it through to ensure that there was a change. Of course, the negotiations, he was accused of allegedly instigating the black-on-black -black violence at the time, during the negotiations. Even Mandela was angry at that time. But um, he did what he did and uh, got that Nobel Peace Prize uh, with Nelson Mandela that he shared, I think, in 1993. Although some said he, he, it should be taken back from him, that the honor shouldn't have come to him. But he played his own role, and he says that I did what I did you know, to ensure that the country wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't fall apart uh, to avert a catastrophe uh, in my country. Indeed, mixed reactions there. Oh, thank you, Betty. We would, I'm sure, we'll still be reaching out to you to, you know, for plans on how the funeral and Definitely. all will take place. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Moving on, but still in South Africa, Oscar Pistorius lawyer Julian Knight says he is hopeful the double amputee sprinter will be released on parole eight years after he shot dead his girlfriend. Mr. Pistorius has been eligible for possible release since July after serving half his 13-year sentence for shooting Reva Stinkamp multiple times through a toilet door in his home on Valentine's Day back in 2013. One of the crucial parts of the process is for Pistorius to have a successful dialogue with the victim's parents. Oscar is a shadow of his former self. He will never be the person he was prior to the incidents that led him into prison. Um, he will never have the life that he had and he will be eternally haunted by the circumstances that led to his imprisonment. So from that point of view, um, whilst he might be in good health as a person who's young and fit and, and, and in, you know, has all his faculties, um, he's, he will always have this over his head. So from that point of view, you know, you, you, yes, he's excited at the prospect of being released on parole, but he will never be able to undo what he's done. And society will always be looking at him, no matter where he goes in life, with regard to what he has done. The offender and the, and the, the victim's family going to face each other face to face, and then now the offender will put forward whether he's feel sorry or not, or has regret or not. I cannot speak for them. I don't know what's going to happen in that uh, meeting. But the whole idea behind victim offender dialogue is restorative justice. And um, one can only hope, we all know, Barry has said many times that he has questions for Oscar. Let's check in with the crisis in Ethiopia. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is hopeful that diplomacy will work in ending the war in Ethiopia. He says he had been in contact with the African Union's special envoy, former Nigerian President Ulusha Gwabasonjo, as well as Jeffrey Feltman, who's the U.S. regional envoy. Mr. Blinken also said he had spoken to Ethiopian Foreign Minister Dekeme Mekonen, emphasizing the need to seriously engage in negotiations 
negotiations on a cessation of hostilities without preconditions. He's also expressing concern that the words coming from both sides of the conflict risked inflaming intercommunal violence. According to him, negotiations for a ceasefire would allow humanitarian aid access and later to negotiate a more durable political resolution. Still to come on the program. Bene Republic celebrates as looted art from France returns home. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. The United Nations says it is yet to receive any explanation from Ethiopia's federal government in Addis Ababa concerning the detention of nine UN staff and at least 70 truck drivers contracted to work for the UN. Spokesperson for Secretary General Antonio Guterres, that's Stefan Dujaric, is calling for their release as they continue to work and engage with the government. On 30th of September, the Ethiopian government expelled seven United Nations human humanitarian staff. We have, as far as I'm aware, not received any official explanation while a number of UN staff, as well as people who have been contracted to work for the UN, um, have, are in detention and continue uh, to be detained. Um, the current numbers that I have is that at least nine UN staff members are currently detained. Um, we're continue to work and engage with the government uh, to secure their release. They've also, as uh, we've also received reports that at least 70 uh, people who've been contracted by the UN to drive uh, trucks have also been detained. They've been contracted by both the UN and a number of international NGOs. Um, and again, we are calling for, uh, for their release. At least one person has been killed and two others injured after an explosion in a small town in the central Ugandan district of Nakaseke. That's about two hours from the capital, Kampala. Eyewitnesses say at the scene say the device was in a pile of scrap metal and the blast killed the scrap metal dealer who was heating it to melt it. Police have cordoned off the scene and have started investigations into the source of the explosive device. They believe the device might have been an old, unexploded bomb. Nakaseke is part of the Luero Triangle, where most of the war that brought President Yoweri Museveni to power in the 1980s was fought. In the past, remnants of explosive devices have killed or injured people in the region. Now, this blast comes less than a month after two separate explosions in the country killed two people and injured several others. Authorities blamed the October attacks on the Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, as a rebel group based in the Democratic Republic of Congo. At least 11 students have been injured after an explosion in an amphitheater at the University of Bua in the restive southwest region of Cameroon. The students had gathered at the venue for a peace event. According to the vice chancellor of the school, unidentified men were seen at the university before the blast. Education institutions have been targeted in recent pasts by separatist groups who are fighting for the independence of the southwest and northwest English speaking regions. An improvised explosive device was thrown on the roof of uh, lecture hall 600 and 600 and uh, on reaching the ground around mid-air on reaching the ground exploded and released shrapnel metallic particles. Uh, the metallic particles injured about 11 students who were in the vicinity. So they were immediately rushed to hospital. U.S. plane maker Boeing has reached an agreement with the families of the 157 people who died in the Ethiopia 737 MAX crash in 2019. According to court documents in Chicago, the plane maker accepts liability for their deaths and in return, families of the victims will not seek punitive damages from the company.
Lawyers for the victims' families said Boeing would still be fully held accountable, welcoming the agreement as a significant milestone. The agreement opens the way for families outside the U.S. in countries such as Ethiopia and Kenya to claim compensation through the U.S. courts rather than in their home countries. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations and the World Food Program is warning that the food crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo is showing little sign of abating and could worsen in the coming months without scaled-up assistance. According to the latest integrated food security phase classification analysis, 27 million people, that is one quarter of DRC's population, face crisis or emergency acute food insecurity conditions. This is fueled by poor harvests, violence-driven displacement, disease and collapsing infrastructure. The reason why we are there in such a fertile environment uh, is not because people cannot produce uh, their food. Uh, it's really because uh, due to insecurity, due to movement, especially when uh, attacks occur during the harvest season, uh, full uh, crops are completely lost, which put these people in this, such a situation. These figures are a wake-up call. Just now it feels like we're bailing a leaky boat. We need to all come together to do more, but differently so that we can set this country on the future that it deserves. To much lighter stories on the program, an NGO in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo is using a blend of the Brazilian martial art of capoeira to help young people affected by decades of insecurity and violence in the region. The street fight aims to achieve something different to promote self-confidence, self-esteem, social skills and physical fitness. Street gang leader Gloria Belume extends a capoeira kick at his friend, who docks and blocks the threatening leg before responding with a deft kick of his own. The city of Gome in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has witnessed its fair share of violence. But this street fight aims to achieve something different, self-confidence and social healing. Gloria Balume and his friends are practicing capoeira, a non-contact Brazilian martial art that combines dance, acrobatics and music. 21-year-old Balume has lived on the street of Goma for 13 years since his parents split up and his father died. As the leader of his group of friends who call themselves the Fire Gang, he hopes Copera will help them realize their dreams of becoming a professional musical group. As an aspiring musician, I tell myself that when I am good at Capoeira, I'll make some songs and videos where I practice it, and that will help me a lot in the future. Capoeira's origins lie in the Kingdom of Congo in present-day Central Africa. It is where Portuguese slave traders took their human cargo to work on sugarcane plantations in Brazil in the 16th century. The arts was developed by slave communities as a form of resistance that could nurture emotional and spiritual empowerment. Authorities banned it for several decades after slavery was abolished, recognizing its power. Now, a Brazilian charity, Gingando Palapes, or GPP, has brought Capoeira back to Congo. The positive thing about Capoeira is that it's easily taught from person to person, especially for children. They learn and teach others, and it's something that they grow to learn. And when a child develops the love for Capoeira, he also becomes a leader. They offer hopeless young people a safe space away from the frequent violence and rape where they can live, play and socialize. 
And finally, on the program, Benin Republic is celebrating the return of 26 royal treasures from France that had been looted by colonial troops in the 19th century. This follows an agreement between the two countries that was finalized in Paris in an event attended by Presidents Patrice Talon and Emmanuel Macron. At a ceremony in Cotonou, attended by representatives of Benin's royal families, President Talon said this return is a testimony to what the country has has been a testimony that Benin existed before now. Among the artworks which had been on display in a Parisian museum, uh, statues from the ancient kingdom of Abome, as well as the throne of King Behanzi, it was looted when French soldiers ransacked a palace in 1892. The artifacts will initially be housed as a museum in the city of Ouda before being transferred to a new museum that is being built in Abome, which was the home to the royal palaces of the kingdom of Dahomey. The restitution is the largest France has made to a former colony, but it represents only a fraction of the 5,000 works whose return Benet is seeking and the tens of thousands of seized African works still held in France. <laughs> And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo. I did okay.